certainly from 1940 on, which culminates in the great final solution. So not Hitler's order, not his plan per se, but done in his name. Whether that in some way lessens his culpability uh, can be argued. But what, what you can't get away from is the notion that without his driving sense of mission, his anti-Semitic mission, there could not have been the development that has occurred by 1939, which leaves us with no other conclusion other than he was the ultimate, the ultimate culprit in the onset of the final solution. Shall I pause there? That, that seems a reasonable place. Depressing place. <laughs> We have some time for questions. You mentioned earlier on that he began in the, at the end of the First World War with a deep fascination with the functioning of power as opposed to particular objectives that he was working towards. In your research, did you find how you think he came to have this uh, veneration of the exercise of power? I think it was put to him by those who said, look at the models of where it has worked. And the outstanding model was 1917. Uh, it seemed to those in 1921 that Bolshevism had triumphed. Now, we know the problem the problem's going to have. But if you're going to seize power, you do it in the way that the Bolsheviks had done in 1917. And that was what they spoke of. Even they hated it, the consequence of themselves, like the white Russians did. That was the model. You don't do it through debate and argument and process. You do it through seizure, which is why it's so ironic that he then turned later to constitutional means. But initially, his love of, of his, his admiration of power was the way it was seized by those who had the willpower to do so. I mean, Mein Kampf is full of willpower notions, isn't it? And Mussolini, he admired as the great man across the Alps, who had, hadn't waited for politics to happen, he'd imposed it. So the Russian example and the Mussolini example are the, are the ones that impress Hitler after 1922, of course, with Mussolini. Um, but power exercised successfully is what impressed him. Which is why he turned away from Munich uh, failure of the Soviet. Because it, it's power bid which fails. Um, the actual machinery, the, the bureaucratic machinery, he never bothered with. It was, it was a seizure concept. The grabbing of power in the name of a greater force, the people, that, that impressed him. Um, I mean, he's very naive in many ways. It's not, it's not, it's not subtle, this. Uh, it, it's very blunt. And it goes on success. Success is its own justification. Thank you. Please. You, you opened with a, with a fascinating riff about uh, Hitler's physical health at the end of the war. I want to turn it to his mental health. I mean, we mostly grew up with the notion you know, of, of the evil of Hitler and associating him with a certain maniacal quality. How, in researching him, did you come up, how did you deal with the issue of his mental health? Well, um, in 1944, there's a fascinating study of his psychological condition by an American psychiatrist, uh, an army psychiatrist. Now, he didn't, he didn't ever interview Hitler, of course, so this is speculating and surmise. But he made, the American doctor made a very shrewd estimate and uh, judgment about the nature of um, Hitler's mental condition. Um, and he, his, his message was, the, the psychiatrist's message was, that here is a man who is subject to, to um, intense, things of intense um, anger, which he suppresses in, in political forms. And is, because he suppresses them, he's willing to let it burst out in things like the Night of the Long Knives or Crystal Night. Now, you can argue that Crystal Night is not a, a Hitler plot, but certainly 34 was. Um, so the psychiatrist's notion was we have a suppressed anger that's politicised, and that at certain key points in the Nazi story, it's unleashed, or he gives permission for it to be unleashed, as it were. Now, whether you can tie it in that way, that policy, to direct functioning of his mental um, capacity, I find difficult. I find all psychohistories difficult to take, because I can't see where the evidence is strong enough. It, it is surmised. I mean, it's fascinating, and the illusions are fascinating. Um, but... Clearly, he becomes more paranoid, if I'm not using the word improperly there, as he grew older, as did Stalin, as did Mao. Now, whether there's a correlation between great power control and paranoia, 
I just throw in as a thought. But certainly his fears as to what would happen if A or B or C wasn't done do intensify as he gets older. And at a point where he seems to be at the zenith of his power, he seems at his most doubting, his most vulnerable, uh, judging by his own internal, uh, his own, uh, internal references. Uh, I mean, his, his afternoon speeches, I don't know how much weight you give to afternoon speeches. <laughs> they were monologues, really, uh, where he just goes on and on, and some people wrote down what he said. Um, do, they do they represent his real thinking, his real schema for his programme? Uh, Possibly not, but the, the, the only insights we have, because he didn't open himself up to anybody else. I mean, Speer makes some diary comments, Goebbels does, but they're all adulatory. There's no, there's no criticism ever of Hitler in these, in these accounts, in these memoirs. So the only accounts we have from Hitler himself, as it were, are these after-dinner tirades, these harangues, which he entered into. Um, and they do to some. Uh, Michael Friedrich did a good study. He said they indicate to him, Friedrich, the idea that he was going increasingly paranoid and that the after dinner tirades were an expression of this mounting hysteria within the man, which uh, is expressed fatally in 44 or 45 when, abandoning all rationality, Hitler adopts this suicidal policy for the nation of going down in flames when he could and should have made peace, or at least he could have called off the absurdity of the, of the Holocaust program and diverted energies spent in killing Jews into fighting the defence of Germany. But he doesn't do that. He becomes uh, taken over with the idea that the first task, the primary task, is destruction of the Jews. Now those irrationalities, as they appear in wartime, have been related by some writers to this progressive mental deterioration. I find it interesting, but always speculative, and I don't know that, that you could always make the reference fit, but it's certainly a fascinating area. But I, th I think the psychology of it is suspect. That's my, that's my worry. The scholarly aspect of it is suspect. I think it would be especially interesting in drawing the possible connections between uh, Stalin and Mao as well, because they did grow increasingly paranoid yes. as they older. Yes, it's uncanny that. It, it's more than just a coincidence, I think. Uh, and it, it, I think it's true of all major leaders that paranoia, whether clinically defined or not, seems to be one of the problems that confronts them. Uh, because uh, I think isn't the answer. By the time they're in great, they have great power. Nobody tells the truth anymore. Nobody speaks to them as they should. Nobody criticises as they should, because the leader is beyond criticism. Stalin, Mao, Hitler, um, Pol Pot, uh, even Castro, I've discovered, um, did not have people who said you've got it wrong. Uh, you don't do that at that level, and that's where the irrationalities come in. Um, but it, I mean, it is a fascinating field. Yes. Thank you. Here's a question in the back. Uh, you've remarked how Hitler is a charismatic leader, and uh, I've often puzzled why uh, you normally associate charismatic leadership with uh, rapid turnover, with instability. But after the Night of the Long Knives, it was incredibly stable uh, political leadership. Uh, yes. And uh, you compare him with Stalin, who was much less charismatic at the same time in the 1930s. One, just one turmoil after another, one purge after another. Yes. And yet Hitler did not uh, conform to that. And yes. He's very hands-off, of course, isn't he? After the Gleichschaltung, the, the consolidation by 34, yeah. when he's got all the institutions under his control, he does very little in terms of government. He didn't govern. Um, he backed off. He let others do it. Um, it is extraordinary that he had such power. But he didn't exercise it in a formal way. Stalin, you're, you're quite right, Stalin does it, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but he's, he's much more concerned with, with the structure and the action in government. Hitler stands back. He gives the nod to things he approves of and rejects those that he doesn't. But he doesn't actually govern. I mean, the, so that's an example. Otto Dietrich, his press secretary, uh, was walking through the lobby of, of the Chancellery and Hitler summoned him over. So Dietrich went, oh God, God. And he said, um, are you free? He's free. He said, yes, I want, I want a press secretary. And he got up and said, right, you're it. He signed a chit and gave it to him. Off he went. Um, and as press secretary, of course, he was a propaganda front. But it was done on 